I, I should say I've, I've only been at Eli, um, and I'll tell you. Well, I'm going to basically tell you what Eli is as an organisation, um, the range of facilities and science it supports, and encourage people who are interested to come and apply for time. And, um, yeah, as I said, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what Eli is. Um, it's a distributed infrastructure. There are three sites: um, one in Czech Republic, one in Hungary, and one in um, in Romania. Um, it's fundamentally surrounded uh, based on offering some of the most powerful um, or high performance lasers in the world. Um, and I was just going to start off, this audience doesn't have any reminder as to what a laser is. The foundation is established by, by Albert Einstein uh, about 100 years ago. Uh, the first practical operating laser um, uh, uh, produced by Theodore Maiman in 1960. And since then, there has been an inexorable improvement in the, the performance of lasers, be it the intensity, the pulse characteristic, the wavelength. And on the left hand side, um, I've showed, included a little graph of the evolution of the intensity of watts per square centimeter of lasers over the years. And you'll see that they sort of plateaued in the 70s and 80s. And then at the end of the 80s, there was a sharp uptick. And since then, there has been a very significant continued increase in the, in the, in the intensity of, of lasers. And the reason for that, the start of that change um, uh, significant increase in intensity is because of the invention of the technical church pulse amplification and in a nutshell one of the things that limited how powerful a laser you could build was the ability of the the various components of the laser to withstand incredibly high intensities so the trick was to take um, an initial pulse stretch it out spectrally so the intent that the, the maximum intensity was much lower Amplify that um, and then recompress it, um, bring it back, back again to a much narrower spectral range. Um, and that was a technique based on radar technology and a, a, a brilliant um, French scientist based in say, Gerard Mouru, um, with his then PhD student, um, Don Strickland, um, invented that technique. But they were so desperate. I met Gerard for the first time about three weeks ago, so desperate. You know, they felt this was such a brilliant but such an obvious idea that they just wanted to get it published as quick as possible. So in a journal, it's not particularly highly rated, but the, that, um, that publication essentially led to the, uh, the award of Nobel Prize in Physics, I think in 2017. Um, so technically, that's um, the, the sort of the, the, the foundation of the technology on which these very high intensity lasers have been built. And so there was one further mod modification, um, and that was to combine the, the CPA amplification scheme with the, the addition of a, the, the, the introduction of an additional high intensity laser pulse um, and so called optical parametric CPA, um, allow the CPA method to be boost, uh, first boosted even further. Now, that's the technical origin, but the sort of the, the concept of Eli as an organization also came from Muru, because what he, 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 he could see that the, 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 the potential of the use of very high intensity lasers over a much wider range of science. So rather than leaving it as the preserve of one or two very specialized labs, what Nuru said is, let's set up a facility to try to make this, this, this technology available to scientists beyond laser experts. So he came back from the US um, to, to Europe um, uh, about 20 years ago, and he started to try to persuade people, the community, the research councils and so forth, to fund an initiative to, 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 to build an institute, and the original concept was an institute in France, um, uh, to, 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 to make this technology available for all. I'll come back to how it was founded and so forth, but um, this audience doesn't need any particular introduction to some of the, the, the quantities involved, but we'll be talking mostly about lasers whose pulse length is about 10 femtoseconds. That's how, that's the, the time in, in, in 10 femtoseconds, light, tra light travels three microns. So it's, it's clearly an extremely short period of time. It's far less time than the average vibrational um, uh, period of a, of a bond in, 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 in molecules. Um, so you might anticipate it allows you to freeze motion to image uh, molecular motion. Um, and you'll also come across um, one of the things, the, the sort of lasers I'll be talking about are generally what we call petawatt class lasers. And given the idea about power, the total global uh, power uh, production capacity for electricity 
um, is only 1% of the petawatt. Um, the entire power of the sun shining on the earth is, 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 is little more than 100 petawatts. But of course, you're delivering that, 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 that power in an extremely short period of time. So one petawatt um, uh, delivered for 10, 10 femtoseconds is only 10 joules. The energy associated with the, the, the lifting 10 kilos by, by one meter. And one thing that's critical for the technology is not only do we offer lasers that are very powerful, very intense, um, whose pulse length is very short to capture fast events, but also that those pulses are can be repeated, can be delivered at a high repetition rate. So that the average energy, if we want to ultimately build devices that are powered by lasers with a moderate power, you need to be delivering that laser pulse uh, very frequently. So we talk about lasers that can have rep rates of over, over 100,000 hertz, for example. And we tend to think of you know, traditionally these high power lasers were things that delivered a shot a minute, sometimes a shot an hour. Um, if you're going to make this technology viable so you can, for example, use it to drive secondary sources of, um, of ions, electrons, <laughs> neutrons, um, you need the average power also to be upped as well. So you need all of those three things um, to come together. And I should say, when it comes to the technology, what's fascinating is while, while the uptick of it was, 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 was a consequence of these very elegant developments, what's happened since actually is really just pure engineering. Um, this now becomes a problem in cooling down the components to get super hot when you pump all that, uh, all that energy through. So very clever engineering is now allowing us to ex extract uh, the full potential of these, these, these things. Um, and then <clears throat> those lasers, and I'll, I'm going to illustrate this in a lot more detail, are applied over quite a wide range of, of problems. Um, so we can use the, the laser beams themselves, um, very fast laser beams, um, directly to probe structural dynamics in materials and biological systems. Um, I'll try and illustrate the fact that you can use these very high intensity lasers as sources of beams, beams of, of ions, protons and heavier ions, for example, um, uh, electrons, uh, uh, and then those electron, uh, those accelerated electron beams themselves um, uh, can also be used as, as, as X-ray and other photon sources. Um, the, powerful, the powerful laser beams can also be used to explore the, the properties of matter under extreme conditions. So we can use these powerful lasers to generate plasmas, for example, to study plasmas. And that's very um, uh, timely at the moment. You may have heard of the result from the National Ignition Facility in the States just before Christmas, where the first um, uh, nuclear laser-driven nuclear fusion um, uh, reaction uh, uh, was reported, but actually ended up in a net gain of, of energy. Well, a net gain of energy, once uh, calibrated against the energy of the laser beam, of course, lasers are not fantastically efficient. So the overall efficiency from the, the, the power at the wall was, was still not an energy gain, but it was a very significant step forward um, in demonstrating that laser-driven techniques could be uh, could made one day on <laughs> the basis of fusion energy. Um, and what we also find is that matter starts to behave in very counterintuitive ways at these high light intensities. So in that graph of intensity versus um, year, um, a significant point, I can't swear away, can I, is 10 to the 24 watts per square centimeter. There's a prediction that if you shine light at 20 to 24 watts per square centimeter into a vacuum, you'll uh, create matter and antimatter out of the vacuum. Um, and we're almost in touching distance on the sort of the, the precursor of those effects. Uh, we're about two orders of magnitude away from that particular point. But as you approach that limit, um, the, the, the properties of the vacuum start to change and you see very nonlinear um, physical phenomena, uh, which themselves might be, might be useful. And then finally, um, one of the things that Eli does is also develop the technology itself. And you know, as, as you said, Trevor, you know, I've gone from um, working in neutron facilities to synchrotron facilities, it was remarkable how, um, how much more quickly the pace of technological development is in a synchrotron compared to a neutron facility. And um, we could have a discussion about when the last real development in neutron technology was. Um, I would say when you go from synchrotrons to lasers, there's also a very significant step up in the speed at which the technology is developing. 
driven directly by industrial applications. So there's a really interesting uh, real link here between use, uh, between industry and, and, the, and the, the institutes that, that exploit this technology. So you, you often find these facilities are alongside a cluster of small and medium-sized companies because they're developing the optical components, they're developing the lasers, and they want to work alongside people then to exploit them. So that, um, that incentive uh, and that idea from that idea from the room, the incentive to provide a very high-end laser facility open to all. Um, uh, originally conceived of uh, in France, um, ended up actually funding three different centres. So at the time, there was a great appetite to try to support um, scientific development and labs in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and in the end, um, the European Commission favoured the use of what they call structural funds. Funds used to develop um, infrastructure uh, in Central and Eastern countries. Now, normally, this is the sort of funding that goes to bridges and tunnels and transport and so forth, dams, whatever. Um, remarkably, um, the Czech Republic, Hungary and, and Romania decided to put a very significant amount of funding into, into basic research. Um, and uh, that was the, the, the origin of setting up three facilities now. So um, in Seged, which is near uh, Budapest, up is 200 kilometers from Budapest, Budapest is too rich to receive structural funds, so they had to put it somewhere else in Hungary. Sega happens to have arguably the, the strongest university in, in Hungary, uh, quite close to the Serbian border. And they had a they had a, a tradition in laser science. Um, in Dali Bujani, which is just outside Prague, Prague again is too rich to receive structural funds. So just outside the bypass, um, the, the beam lines facility that was established. And then the third facility is in Magareli, which is just outside Bucharest. In Romania, and that um, was traditionally uh, a nuclear physics institute. Um, so when you know when the Soviet Union was funding these countries to build nuclear weapons, this was a real center of excellence in uh, in, in Romania. Um, and since that time, they've been finding other reasons to develop nuclear physics. So the third facility has an emphasis. So the first facility uh, has an emphasis on ultra short uh, lasers and ultra short measurements ultra-fast measurement. The second one is all about high intensity. And the third facility brings together what's a world unique combination of high intensity lasers, but also a tunable high energy, uh, high intensity gamma source, which can tune nuclear energy states, and then with the lasers um, interrogate the nature of those, those things. So a three um, site distributed infrastructure. And since then, um, two of those sites have come together in what's called an ERIC. Well, I think it's S's an ERIC, isn't it? Yes. So, yeah, okay, there you go. So, you know, there are advantages in forming Eric in that, you know, you get all sorts of legal benefits, tax benefits, and so forth. But I would actually say more significantly, by bringing the Czech and Hungarian centers together as one organization, you also put them under the same umbrella as two organizations that really have strong motivation to work together, to collaborate scientifically, and to develop their technology in complementary ways. So the ERIC so far has got four members. So the host countries, Czech Republic and Hungary, um, Italy and um, Lithuania. Lithuania incidentally has a great tradition in laser science. It was Lithuanians who invented the, um, uh, the, the optical development of uh, uh, CPA. Um, uh, did I say Italy and um, Lithuania? Yes, I did. And then we have as observers, but they have only a little bit longer to decide whether or not they're actually going to pay or not. Um, we have Germany and uh, and um, uh, what am I missing? Germany and Bulgaria. And had Brexit not happened, the UK would probably be up there as well. But uh, um, sadly, they're, they're outside at the moment. So those two facilities working together as a single entity. We have the managing director Alan Weeks, who actually was at ESS not very long ago. Um, I don't know if you overlapped. I don't Karina. think we overlapped, but okay. yeah, it can't but, be long because I hear the name. That's right. So he, he left Sweden for um, uh, for for Prague um, for the Czech Republic uh, five six years ago. Okay. So a little bit about the science. What what do we what do we do? Well, one of the things we do is we use ultra short lasers to look at fast processes. And, you know, the technology uh, fast processes have been developing um, again in leaps and bounds over the years. So. I was going to say 100 years ago, every time I see this, no, it's actually maybe 50 years ago, there's the famous um, uh, imaging of, of, of the horse in full flight through a series of cameras that are sequentially triggered. 
allowing um, uh, movies, pictures, um, uh, films to be made uh, at sort of millisecond time resolution. And of course, if you contemplate you know, 10, 20 years, 20 or 30 years ago in your traditional SLRs to have a mechanical device in it, which would allow you um, uh, to take millisecond pictures. Um, that was then, uh, uh, um, technology was developed through the use of uh, replaced by electronic sync flash, allowing images to be taken on this micro to nanosecond time scale. And then much more recently, Archimedes has availed, uh, led the, uh, the development of uh, femtosecond laser technology that started to, uh, uh, that allowed us, particularly those of us as chemists who are interested in chemical reactions, to start to, um, to, to, to look at to image molecules on times, the sort of time scales um, that allowed one to, to produce chemical reactions. So um, 10 seconds, I would say, being, you know, of the order of magnitude of the period of oscillation. And what we're trying to offer now in starting to offer in Segued in Hungary is time scales that are up to a thousand times faster than that, going beyond 10 seconds now, well faster than 10 seconds. And what that allows that allows you to do is to go uh, from, uh, from looking at, sorry, colored lines, I can barely see the spot. It's only like maybe exactly where I'm going to see it. So, so femtoseconds takes us into probing um, uh, time scales of bonds breaking. Um, as we go faster still, we can start to see the movement of electrons, be it movement of electrons in, in, in solids and nanostructured solids, and then at shorter time scales and faster processes still, the movement of electrons in, in the process of chemical reactions or electrons in atoms as they, as they excite in the various exotic states. Um, and, and ALPS places itself firmly at the very um, uh, high end of the range of techniques in terms of looking at extremely short um, processes. But how does it do that? Well, the drive lasers themselves, you know, at the moment, sort of the state of the art technically is lasers whose pulse lengths are of the order of 10 seconds. So how do you produce a probe which allows you to look orders of magnitude faster than 10 femtoseconds? And the way that you do that is through what's called high harmonic generation, usually in the gas. And I think if you get the animation to run, um, there we go. And this tries to illustrate um, how femtosecond laser pulses can produce um, attosecond light pulses. So you come in and bear with me here. I think the drive laser is represented by red. Is that red? Good, okay. So we've got a drive laser beam, goes into a chamber where you have uh, a gas jet. And as the high intensity laser goes into the gas jet, it ionizes the, the, the gas in the jet. It could be helium, it could be a variety of gases, but it's, in this case, this is, this is just helium. Um, so you have the individual atoms subjected to very short, very high intense, and I'm sorry, this is the world's slowest animation. I've, um, I'm not entirely sure why it runs so slow, so it's, it's going to take a minute to <laughs> You could sort of just, you know, chill out this kind of coffee. <laughs> coffee. Uh, but the point is, what this is supposed to illustrate, I'll go a little bit more dynamically, is that under the very high electromagnetic field, you get ionization, the electron or multiple electrons sometimes separated um, from the atom that remains, they, they recombine, and that recombination process gives rise to a uh, higher um, energy, um, very high intensity, shorter pulse of light. light. Um, so that's that's the essential basis of the, the original femtosecond um, driving laser creating um, much shorter light pulse. It's generally of a higher energy. And then th this process is driven in a coherent fashion. So those individual pulses add together coherently. So what you get out the other end of um, of, of gas um, jet um, is a second beam, um, which is generally higher in energy. So you might have an infrared driving laser and you get a, a, an ultraviolet or a vacuum ultraviolet um, pulse out of it, um, which has a much shorter time scale, um, running as it were in parallel with the drive laser. So you have the, you know, the cartoon with the red and, and the blue. And then through a variety of um, optical devices, um, you can separate those two pulses out. You can, you can apply a delay, a control delay in time of, say, the attosecond pulse 
um, compared to the um, to the, the original chemical second drug, or by or vice versa. So what you now have here is a means of um, producing, um, providing two layers of beans from one uh, with a control delay, and it's the basis essentially of pump probe technique. But pump probe techniques with at a second controllable, um, at a second, sorry, an at a second um, uh, um, initial stimulation with a delay that can also be of the order of attoseconds. Um, and that, that's, that's essentially the, the, the origin of, or, or the technical basis of a lot of the, the techniques that, that we provide. And of course, you know, I imagine many of you are chemists here. Who hands up who's a chemist or a chemist? Trevor, you're a sort of chemist. I'm a physicist. Oh, are you? <laughs> but, yeah, what you? A lot of what you do, I think, on the so, so, yeah. Let's not talk about labels, but anyway, I'm sure most people in the room could appreciate that um, um, this can provide a very powerful way of stimulating molecular change uh, and then interrogating what the change is. So you come out with a stimulating probe, um, uh, you knock the system out of equilibrium, you excite a particular bond or an electronic transition, and then your second pulse comes along and that performs a form of spectroscopy on it. So it could be an infrared pulse that is, is, is tuned to look at a particular bond um, in, in the material uh, with the control time delay. Um, so the cartoon here is simply of the, the pump um, coming in and exciting some kind of molecular transformation, and then the probe, um, spectroscopic probe, uh, looking at a characteristic um, um, spectral feature um, that, that, is, that arises as a consequence of the molecular transformation. As I say, that any arbitrary delay more or less can be applied between the two. So you can build up a map of uh, the relates um, <clears throat> uh, the, the excitation center with a structural change that ensues. And that can also be combined with, with other techniques. And again, it's a rather simple um, cartoon here, but it's meant to illustrate that if you combine the pump probe in combination, for example, with mass spec, you can not only get the, the spectral information, what is the, the molecular fingerprint, uh, of, the, of the, the species you've excited, but also how it might fragment. Uh, one of the recent experiments supported in, in, um, in, in Alps in Hungary uh, is looking at the way in which, um, uh, I can't, I can put my glasses on, exactly what it is. Um, no, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's, it's, a, it's essentially a molecular uh, reaction which the, the, the pump drives a fragmentation reaction and we can follow that fragmentation reaction both through the, um, the, the, the infrared fingerprint and also the, the fragments that come off as a, as a function of time. Um, and then the other thing that, that can be done is pushing the energy of the, uh, the, the secondary beam that's produced with this high harmonic generation up into the X-ray region. You can also start to generate um, pulses of light um, generally in the soft x-ray, we, we're not talking about very many kilovolts here. We have other ways of producing 10 kilovolt x-rays, um, <clears throat> but also um, uh, allowing us to set up pump probe um, measurements where, where the, the probe now could be a soft x-ray beam. So you can stimulate a change in, say, uh, a nanoparticle or an molecular cluster, um, and then follow the change in structure of that through X-ray diffraction as a, as a function of time at very fast time scales. So looking in this particular case, a case of cartoon, but the proof of concept is starting to be demonstrated now, um, looking at uh, change in this case, cluster structure through the way in which the, the X-ray diffraction pattern changes at sort of a, a femtosecond time scale. So direct use of the, um, <coughs> of the beams to look at dynamics and structure. The second area, and it's probably the one that's once we've really got the facility running, and I should say we're only really a year into full user operations. It's really early days yet. We offered, we're on our second user call. We offered 10 instruments on our first user call. We offered 34 on our second user call and many more in our next. So we're really just ramping up at the moment. And I think one real growth area is the use of high intensity lasers now to provide secondary sources of um, particle beams and, and light. I'll look at two cases. First of all, um, it's it's the generation of electron beams um, by the by, by, by shining lasers onto plasmas. 
and this is based on possible weight field acceleration. So again, in cartoon form, you take a high intensity laser, um, use a high intensity laser, I can't see. Um, you shine it into your gas plume, as you saw in the previous, the first of the cartoons, you can ionize the gas um, uh, in, that, in that plume. Um, and then what you find is that as the laser propagates through the plume, um, leaving behind it in its wake electrons and further behind the heavier ions, the electrons tend to get pulled away along in the wake of the, the electromagnetic pulse. Um, so the consequence of shining a pulse high intensity laser into um, a gas plume that can be ionized is the generation of uh, a very quickly propagating beam of electrons separated from the ions. And that's called laser wave field acceleration. Um, and that's significant because the electric field gradients that you get with these really high intensity fields are far greater, about a thousand times greater than the field gradients you get in, in, in traditional RF based accelerators. So, you, so <clears throat> traditional RF based accelerators, the salt is the power, um, the LINAC in, 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 um, that feeds into the booster and feeds into the synchrotron max four, they tend to have uh, maximum field gradients of about. Um, 100 millivolts, megavolts rather, not millivolts, megavolts and meter. Um, and beyond that, you get dielectric breakdown. There's a limit to the technology. And that means, of course, that these devices tend to be tens of meters, or if you want to get up to gigavolt uh, energies, they tend to be almost kilometers long. Um, this technique is in its infancy, but it's come on in leaps and bounds in the last few years. Um, and we're starting to get reproducible um, electric field gradients of about 100 gigavolts and meter. So in principle, one could put um, uh, an entire LINAC or uh, a device, the sort of device that would uh, inject uh, electrons into a synchrotron ring in, a, in, a, in, in just a few millimeters. So we really are talking about tabletop devices, not yet very stable, um, but the principle of the technology is, 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 is inc incredibly powerful. And we're starting to see stable devices coming out of this based on this, this principle. So there's weight field acceleration. Um, is going to be the basis of some of the new beam lines at, um, at Eli. You might imagine um, uh, in the longer term, there are very practical applications. Um, as Karina used to work, top left there. And as I said, we need Linux, so there are typically tens of meters. Uh, we have storage of ring, storage rings with insertion devices. Again, we're meters in size. Um, it, is, it is starting to become practical to generate high intensity x-rays with much smaller laser-driven devices. Uh, and typically, you can imagine them driving and uh, producing uh, photons at around about the 25 kilovolt region, very, very small uh, coherent sources with low divergence and pulses, which are now actually much shorter than would be um, uh, the case in, in, in a normal synchrotron. So typically of the order of 10 seconds um, long and increasingly practical as bright devices. Um, uh, so, if you compare commercial uh, um, uh, X-ray um, devices here, so um, on the right-hand side, a two-hour scan from a Brooklyn Micro CT device of uh, the mouse embryo. On the left, there's um, probably about five-year-old data out of the central laser facility at the other lab in the UK, so the astral laser driving now one of these next-generation betatron sources. Um, we're, we're getting comparable results, comparable to commercial uh, micro CT devices. If you look forward, the, the calculations of the sorts of uh, beta tron sources that we should be able to um, produce, and they're actually starting to build right now, should reduce the scan time by about four orders of magnitude. Um, so we're starting to see um, uh, and these are sort of early results from beta, laser driven beta trons. Um, the fixed mapper plot in the CNRS. And, uh, and if, you, if you look forward to, to the likely scan time the same resolution, um, we're predicting about four orders of magnitude from these, these, these laser-driven um, uh, X-ray sources. So um, really very much now the cutting edge of what you can do with synchrotrons. Um, what else you can do with those electron beams rather quickly? Uh, a lot of interest from um, in, in relation to medical applications. Um, to, and to some extent now clinical applications. So hospitals tend to be very, very demanding um, of new technology, wanting to really 
know that it's tried and tested and understood. Um, but uh, electron beam therapy is starting to be um, accepted, at least on a trial basis, by, by, by um, some of the hospitals that uh, some of the leading uh, laser driven electron beam sources are working with. The graph on the left hand side sort of illustrates the sort of um, qualities you're looking for in the electron beam. So you're looking, and, and, and here the trick is to, is to deliver um, an electron beam dose through multiple beams, all converging on the same point. Um, uh, a high dose to the, 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 the region of the arabia, whilst minimizing the dose to the surrounding tissue. Um, so you want relatively penetrating um, beams, um, which, um, which have a high ratio of um, depositing energy in, the, in the, the region of interest compared to the tissue through which it propagates. Um, and high energy electrons really do seem to occupy the sweetest spot of all in this diagram, the top right diagram. So um, early, um, <coughs> early applications of, of high energy electron beams for therapy are starting to look very promising. And those electron beams are also starting to be used in um, very high speed uh, electron microscopy. So electron microscopy, we tend to think of as quasi-static technique, um, but it's starting to look feasible to, to, to develop sub nanosecond um, electron microscopy techniques based on, on the, uh, laser driven sources. Uh, so that's electron beams. Um, uh, we can also generate very intense beams of ions. And the way that we do that is to direct the high intensity laser pulse onto a, a thin solid target, so a, a foil of a variety of compositions. Uh, and what you get out on the other side of the foil is a mixture of of electrons and ions, um, and through a variety of techniques, you can separate out the ions and produce ion beams with very, very high um, accelerated gradient. So again, it's, it's a very similar sort of point to the one I made with the, the Betatron sources. Laser-driven ion sources um, can be made far more compact than would be normally the case in, um, um, in, in high energy and advanced physics. And again, there are a lot of um, applications of proton beams and other uh, and heavier ion beams. So that, that NIF result, the ignition, the, the fusion result, um, uh, relies on laser-driven accelerated protons, um, which are then uh, used to, 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 to trigger a uh, nuclear fusion reaction. Um, and uh, another application is, is to use, well, it's, it's a technique not unlike what you have in an explosion source where you direct a high energy proton beam onto a heavy metal target. Um, you can do something very, very similar with laser-driven uh, protons, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a very much more compact sense. So rather than this being tens uh, or even hundreds of meters long, um, the distance between the proton source and the proton target is typically a few centimeters. So you have um, ultimately the, the, the ability to produce so the, the total neutron flux of these is many orders of magnitude, about four orders of magnitude below a relatively weak explosion source, but it's focused into a nanosecond pulse. So, um, so this allows you to, and, and actually there's an awful lot of ground that you can make up in terms of upping the it's really early days yet in terms of making this technology um, viable, um, but, um, but as a foundation for potential very high intensity, very short pulsed uh, neutrons. It's extremely um, interesting. And at the moment in, in SEGED, as the high rate, rate lasers come on stream and as the average energy comes on stream, so you can imagine um, really uh, quite useful average fluxes of neutrons. And that will be applied in fast. Uh, I should say to them, these are neutrons, which are, they tend to be megavolt neutrons rather than millivolt neutrons. So they're neutrons that can be used primarily um, uh, for imaging of the neutron physics. In principle, you could moderate them. You could take them down to thermal neutron energies. But at the moment, the primary, um, the primary energy is using those neutrons as for fast neutron imaging or in, um, uh, uh, <coughs> in a variety of nuclear technologies. Um, and then when you go to heavier ions, there's a huge interest in taking heavier ions, such as carbon ions, and then using them as the basis again of ion beam therapy, um, because they're even better than, than, 
than, than electrons and um, um, photons at delivering a dose precisely where you want it to. So that that um, the, almost the tunability of delivering a dose to a rather specific region of the body um, is particularly good for relatively heavy ions. So one of the things that we're using at all three Eli centers is, uh, is, is relatively high intensity ion beams with the aim eventually of setting up hadron therapy centers. Um, and at the moment, um, there isn't any hadron therapy in all of Central and Eastern Europe. So there's, a, there's also a huge, um, and you can see the sort of distribution of hadron therapy centers throughout, uh, throughout Europe. And there's an absolute void here. And these tend to be techniques that people need to travel to on a regular basis. Um, so it's, it's, there's a real need to have these distributed geographically so they can serve the populations in those, in those countries. Um, and then finally, with uh, radiobiology, with iron beams, something that's been emerging recently, and you probably know much more about this than me, um, the effectiveness of iron beam and actually other beam therapies appears for reasons that are completely not understood to be far stronger if they're delivered as very short, high intensity doses, as opposed to the same dose that's spread over time. Um, so this flash therapy appears to be statistically very significantly more effectively for reasons that no one really understands. Well, I don't know if, you, if you've come across this, Trevor, and read this, yeah. but in the last year, it, it, it's, a, it's a sort of, yeah, it's a, um, it's an experimental observation at the, at the moment. No one has any really real idea as to why it's. I mean, there are, there are, there are the speculation theory, but there's no real um, technical insight into why flash therapy appears to be far more effective at uh, um, solving all sorts of uh, cancer related problems. And then finally, I'll only touch on this briefly for this audience. Um, the high intensity laser beams are start you being used to generate matter. Um, in extreme conditions and study that matter. So in the um, in context of uh, fusion technology, um, laser-driven or laser inertial combined fusion, um, there's a huge amount of interest after those, those results from just before Christmas, but also trying to understand in general plasmas, e even sort of traditional fusion energy, magnetic combined fusion, requires us to better understand how plasmas behave and how they can be controlled. And lasers play a real role in generating and exploring the properties of plasmas. Uh, and then finally, as I said, when you go to um, very extreme electric fields, you start to generate matter and antimatter out of the vacuum. And in the run-up to that, a couple of, the, of orders of magnitude, lower intensity beams, you start to see distortions of the vacuum, such that the, um, the optical properties of the vacuum can, to some extent, be controlled and might be the basis of optical devices for lasers themselves. So, Manipulating the vacuum, altering its refractive index in a controlled way, and using that as a means of, uh, of, of, of producing laser optics. Uh, so, I'll touch briefly on the, the, the three centers themselves. So, this is the center in Donjani, just outside Prague. So, this is the Eli beam lines. Um, ooh, didn't realize it was animated. So, this focus here um, is very much on the high intensity side. So, there's a lot of plasma physics. There's uh, now, um, uh, we're starting to bring on stream these secondary sources of, of X-rays and accelerated particles, uh, but also using high-intensity lasers to probe matter. And I'll just give you one or two examples of that. Um, here's the site. Um, this, is, this is primarily offices. And then the technical center is here. And alongside, sorry to stray off, um, we have the High Laser Lab, which is a, a technology development center. So this is, this is very much um, uh, an industry and tech transfer uh, center. Um, and there's a very strong link locally with Charles University in Prague, but increasingly as we become more international, it'll become more out of the world. Um, so yeah, there it is. Um, I should say at the moment, we've got about 350 people working there, 30,000 square meters, um, budget of about 50 million a year. Um, and it's organized in, in three layers. So we have the plants at the top, we have four laser drive systems in the middle, and then we, those lasers are directed into a bunch of experimental balls per week we have to a whole range of experiments. So we started off with an in-house construction, uh, the so-called L1 laser. It's not the world's most powerful laser, but it allowed the local team, who were not all laser experts at this end, to actually develop the skills. Um, and they could then go on and, and develop higher-end lasers. 
Um, we've, this year, we've just brought on stream uh, the, the L3 system, it's built the loads a little more, but again, a lot of local expertise. Um, and this will ultimately be a, a petawatt class loader that operated at 10 hertz. So petawatt at 10 hertz will be world leading when it works and will be there in about two years. Uh, and then we're a little bit further behind in the other two laser systems. The L4 came on in a limited um, capacity in the last use call. And the L2, I can't tell you when it could be ready because it's the cutting edge. We don't, and that's one of the, the, I think one of the lessons here is that if everything works on day one, you're probably not trying hard enough to be edgy about it. So this is, so as a laser facility, it's not like a synchrotron when you switched on on a Tuesday morning at 10 and it comes on 99% of the time. It's the kind of facility you'll switch it on and three quarters of the time, it'll be up halfway through the day. Um, the real challenge for us when the operators use a facility is either to manage expectations or to really understand what the most unreliable looks to the system. And I think you know, maybe in five years time, uh, maybe in 10 years time, it'll, it'll be approaching something like the reliability of a synchrotron, but we don't know exactly how we're gonna get the next day. Um, so L2 is not running. Um, so three, three laser systems operational, feeding into three laser balls. Um, I won't go through all the stats, we can look at them later, but these are uh, among the world's highest uh, power lasers. Um, the L1 system, however, is the one that feeds into a collection of instrumentation. Um, so this is a room, I don't know, 30 meters by almost 20. Um, and in that, we have a whole set of what we call end stations, which take the rate laser beams um, from them, produce these secondary sources, and then the secondary sources are used in a variety of ways. And I'll just give you one example. Um, uh, in among that, we are, we are developing and we will soon have ready for users uh, a plasma X-ray source. Um, tunable between 3 and 4 kilovolts, but the point is that it will run um, uh, uh, some nanosecond um, time scale. So at the moment, we're just, Trevor, this is Charles' play for you. You know, we've got the structure of license on that, but you know, woohoo. Um, uh, the point is though, that when this comes on stream, we'll be able to measure structures at, um, at sub picosecond time scales and do that in conjunction with pump probe measurements. So looking at structure stroboscopically, um, uh, sub picosecond time slices as you pump, I don't know, UV light, infrared light, or whatever into it. And we're in the process of making this as a reliable sub picosecond um, X ray uh, diffraction source. Um, we just brought onto the user program uh, a tunable um, uh, uh, iron beam source. Um, and I won't go into the DATLs, but the lasers are driving a variety of iron beams whose energy can be controlled, which can be focused. Um, and then they can be used either to deliver iron beams, potential for therapy, deliver iron beams in implantation studies. So putting irons into semiconductors, for example, um, um, uh, and also performing these radiobiology experiments and an awful lot of uh, work being put into. In, so in understanding therapy, you also have to better understand the radiobiology. There's a lot of research kicking off into the effect of the radiation on um, biological systems. I should say we have, as an adjunct to move on, we have a zebrafish lab, uh, among other things. Everyone seems to have zebrafish labs. We've got a particularly effective one in Seged, and we can we can fly the zebrafish in an hour from Seged to um, uh, to to Don Rajani because they have they have a local airport in great place. Um, and then also recently. Uh, plasma physics platform has been brought on to use the lasers now to generate um, and study through a variety of diagnostics, uh, a variety of patterns. Uh, and then just coming on stream in the next round, we will have two electron beam um, stations. One is electrons, um, electron beams, which are used for irradiation. Uh, and then the other beam line will be electrons that are then used in conjunction with the insertion device as the basis of, of a local fell. Um, so we will be building and exploiting a fell, laser driven fell, um, probably about two years oh. from now. And exploring um, again how you can push this technology of fells, but this time uh, laser driven, very compact um, mm. source, at a fraction, I should say, at a fraction of the cost. Um, and then in Seged, you know, it helps the, 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 the emphasis here is on ultra short laser and ultra short measurements. So, this is the Atosecond Science Center. Um, it's 
in principle had zillions of lasers and end stations, but actually the way that breaks down is that on the left hand side, we are bringing on stream a number of drive lasers. Um, um, they then feed into a number of secondary sources to generate yet uh, shorter pulses of different energies. And then in combination with the drive laser and the secondary sources, you can provide, a, you can measure, uh, offer a variety of pump probe techniques. So here the emphasis is very much on pump probe uh, chemistry and physics, uh, combination of drive lasers, secondary sources, end stations, but also with an awful lot of metrology. So a lot of detector um, technology, and I won't go exhaustively through the slides, but just to say the workhorse was a, a sort of almost off the shelf mid infrared laser, uh, a modest power operating at three microns, but in combination, there were some really quite interesting end stations. And um, so devices to look at molecular fragmentation, um, essentially mass specs, so that once you've initiated the reaction, you can very quickly see what fragments that come off it. And then most recently, we are starting to offer lasers that are an order of magnitude and then, uh, sorry, three orders of magnitude, higher intensity than the, the, the MIR um, uh, initial work course, in combination, as I said, with uh, chemical diagnostics and um, nano esker and, and PU to look at the changing electronic structure of surfaces, so surface physics now. Um, uh, with the laser as a pump. Um, as I said, next year we should be offering really high rate, rate, high average energy lasers that are essentially the, the most powerful in the world to look at these, these, these pump probe systems. The key thing with pump probe incident is the signal you get is generally very weak. So you have to you have to accumulate more for the statistics, which is why having a hundred um, hundred kilohertz system really allows you to look with much better statistics for some of these very fast processes. And then finally, um, not part of the ERIC, but came on stream last year, um, the nuclear physics facility Magarelli in Romania, um, that now has the highest power laser in the world um, of this type. It's got a 10.4 petawatt laser, um, uh, just started operating at Easter. And these people will be uh, able to do study matter under the, the most extreme conditions on the planet for about two years. They're probably going to have the world lead for about two years. They've got immensely powerful lasers. They don't yet have all the end stations up and running. So the real work here is to actually get the, 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 the chambers in which you do your science up and running with the diagnostics. Um, so, so as I said, world leading lasers, but it isn't, uh, it's, it's only starting to connect with the technical science. And then finally, um, as an end user facility, we are, um, open to, um, we have an open access port twice a year, um, the sort of traditional excellent space access, which is the case of Max 4, and will be, I imagine, for uh, um, There is a lot of pressure on us also to develop programs, uh, mission-based programs, to actually have uh, coordinated programs in thematic areas. You know, it could be energy, it could be therapy, it could be uh, biomedical imaging, we're not yet sure what those would be, uh, and we're open to, to industry. Um, we've just gone through our second peer review um, call. We've been working with people like Karina to develop the whole support infrastructure uh, for the user office. So our first user call was very much Excel spreadsheets because we only had about 40 proposals. Uh, but in anticipation that we will be inundated, um, we've actually started to really professionalize the um, process. And that second user call was the first that actually had a physical peer review panel. Um, so. Um, so we had about 100 proposals um, allocating over 30 instruments, six subject-based panels. Um, the lion's share of the science at the moment, you probably can't read it, but uh, atomic, molecular, and optical physics and chemistry, surface and material science. But as we bring on the high-intensity lasers, and these are fed by the low the lower intensity lasers, as the high-intensity lasers come on stream, what we're starting to see is people wanting to use particle acceleration, um, beam lines. Uh, to start to do plasma physics and to start to look at some of these exotic states of matter, what's called relativistic and ultra relativistic interactions. You know, what happens to matter when you accelerate it um, uh, under these incredible field frames? And you, you might be interested um, countries that apply for beam time. This is probably the most significant. So, this is uh, if you look at every single country <coughs> applied in the last call, um, 
uh, and ask the question, what is the nationality of their institute? We don't know what nationality, we don't know what passport they have, but we know what nationality their institute is. Um, interestingly, um, uh, the, the highest demand in countries, the highest demand in five countries are countries which don't pay anything yet. Um, I mean, no, that's not true. Italy does pay, but not very much. But the States, France, the UK, and Germany don't. Sweden is actually quite healthy, and it's quite healthy because you have very strong active second laser science here in England. So most of these, most of these people are coming to England. Um, and, and we, you know, it's, it's, it's early days, it's the statistics of small numbers, but we're starting to see interesting trends coming through. Um, and it's quite nice that we're actually seeing a lot. I mean, we had three, 300 people um, involved in the proposals in the first round. And then finally, um, in terms of collaborations, um, very international. One or two countries, of course, haven't yet collaborated, be through membership or through co funded projects. Um, very international in terms of staff. We've got almost 600 staff. Yes, the majority from Central Europe, but actually some very significant engagement, particularly from Italy, um, which has a particularly strong after second science community um, and the publication started. And then finally, should you be interested in learning more about better what? Based science or petabot laser science or after second based laser science. Um, we have uh, a very short summer school at the end of August um, to which everyone is welcome to subscribe. I think we had about 300 people last time, uh, 100 of whom were physically there um, uh, to give people an introduction to the techniques and the applications of these lasers. And that's it.